environmental writer and social activist Terry Tempest Williams wrote, the eyes of the future are looking back at us and they are asking us to see beyond our time. So it is with socio-environmental research. Using modeling as a part of this research is fundamentally motivated by the desire to envision and plan for better futures. Welcome to Succinct's learning series on socio-environmental modeling. I'm Margaret Palmer, director of SYNC and also a professor at the University of Maryland. This is part three of building the basics for socio-environmental systems modeling. One, introduce the fundamental characteristics of socio-environmental systems as complex adaptive systems, laying the groundwork for understanding essential features of nonlinear dynamical systems that must be captured in models. Part two focused on the vexing problems associated with socio-environmental systems and how diverse modeling teams can span boundaries to understand and explore solutions to these. This third part of the tutorial focuses on when and why different types of modeling approaches are applied to socio-environmental systems. This is the formalization phase in the modeling process. That is, the phase when decisions must be made about model structure, parameters, and calibration. We could develop a computer simulation, a network model, or a purely mathematical model, but different approaches require different sorts of information. For example, geospatial models require spatially explicit data on the model components while network models require defining relationships or connections between the various components. And the choice among modeling options are also strongly influenced by disciplinary perspectives. Let me give you one example related to my own field of research. Socio-hydrological models are an outgrowth of a long modeling tradition by hydrologists. The hydrologic portions of the model are typically far more developed and nuanced than the social models associated with them, even though complex social dynamics are associated with water use decisions. Dealing with such dynamics may be difficult given the structure of many hydrologic models that are great for forecasting hydrological response, but not so great for predicting social decisions and subsequent environmental conditions. Fortunately, today, scholars are developing more sophisticated socio-hydrological models that move in this direction, namely to bring in behavior and decisions better. In a recent paper by Giuliano di Baldassara and colleagues, they described the evolution of socio-hydrological modeling as well as its relevance to the sustainable development goals. Feedbacks between human and water systems generate phenomena which are the actual outcomes, paradoxical dynamics, or unintended consequences that arise from water management. Social hydrology aims to understand the feedbacks that generate these phenomena, which involve power relations, trust issues, cultural beliefs, cognitive biases that strongly influence the way in which people alter and adapt to change hydrological regimes. The ultimate goal is to prevent mismatches between governance and the changing dynamics of human water systems. So from what Giuliano said, it's pretty clear why socio-hydrological modeling is important, and that's reflected in many studies that are actually coming out now. Still, the hydrologic history of these models remains apparent. But setting aside disciplinary-based selection of modeling approaches, how is a modeling approach selected to study socio-environmental systems? Well, it turns out that there are so many types of models and even many ways to classify modeling approaches, and this applies to all sorts of modeling, not just SE systems, that the best way to start is to think about why the model is being developed and what types of products are needed. But you'd be surprised how often this is not the case and the model ends up not being very useful. Okay, let me mention the four most common modeling goals and provide some specific examples. So these include, first, for predicting. And these kinds of modeling approaches are usually focused on the status of part of the system based on knowledge of other components. 
The second would be the goal to explore and understand the system, say, for example, teaching or promoting social learning among stakeholders. A third broad category of goals is to optimize a decision, for example, how to design a proposed policy. And then a fourth is to envision a future, often called scenario modeling. For any one of these goals, there are multiple ways to formalize a model, and choosing the best approach will also depend on data availability, characteristics of the system, and the level of certainty requirement. It also is influenced by the types of processes and interactions that are most important to a specific modeling goal. Combining factors like these that influence the selection of the model with the four categories of modeling goals is the basis of a decision tree process that can help you decide what type of model to use. And this process is nicely covered in another tutorial in this series by Serena Hamilton and colleagues. But for now, let's focus on some generalizations associated with each of the four modeling goals I mentioned. Now, most of these aren't unique to socio-environmental systems, as you'll recognize. The first is that predictive models are typically empirically informed models. That is, data-oriented models. They can be statistical relationships that generate predictions, or they can be computationally intensive ones like dynamical simulation models. Regardless, unless the fundamental relationships are known, the parameters used in a model are usually statistical estimates. For example, regression coefficients are estimates of the unknown population parameters, and they describe the relationship between a predictor variable and the response. Rather than precise estimates, these models aim to make predictions or forecasts of a system's likely distribution of future states. For example, the likelihood that the governance state of a socio-environmental system will be characterized in a specific way. To understand and explore an SE system, now I'm referring to the second goal category, modeling teams sometimes use simple analytically tractable mathematics to understand the general attributes or dynamics of the system. The goal now is to understand the system better. Often, however, socio-environmental modelers use agent-based models, or ABMs, in the lingo. This is really useful if the goal is to understand, for example, how heterogeneity within a group of actors influences modeling outcome. This is useful for socio-environmental systems because how people behave and make decisions can be very different due to historical contingencies, different contexts, or other factors. A network approach is also often used when the goal is exploratory or descriptive modeling of socio-environmental systems, especially used by the social scientist. These are useful in understanding interactions and linkages, especially those between social actors. Bayesian belief network modeling is yet another approach that can be used to understand and explore SE systems. These are probabilistic graphical models where some variables are conditionally dependent. They can be built from data or expert opinion, and they're useful particularly when uncertainty is an issue. Ecologists have actually used these extensively, but so have economists, computer scientists, and others. And maybe one reason for this is that aside from their use, in getting a general understanding of a system, they can also be used to explore causal relationships between factors and assess the influence of each input variable on the resulting outcome. So for an example, focusing on management of an Indonesian community-based fishery, Hoshino and colleagues developed a Bayesian belief network model using results from in-depth local surveys. Their model, these are called BBNs, included the links between the many factors that can influence socioeconomic and environmental outcomes of different management decisions. They were able to show that the impact from multiple factors can be much larger than the impact from a single source, which indicated for their particular study that management actions would be most effective when addressing multiple factors or drivers at the same time. This is really useful information in management. Okay, now on to the third goal category of modeling, and that is informing or optimizing decisions. These link an action and its effect to a specific objective. And usually these models combine a mathematical definition of the objective with a mathematical or simulation model that defines the behavior of the system 
in response to a feasible set of controls. The selection of control values is the decision and the models optimize one or more dimensions of the objective over possible decisions. Today, many interesting examples of optimization modeling comes from those companies that are trying to respond to increasing social demands for more sustainable products. So these companies build goal-based mathematical models that include both social and environmental attributes that reflect our, that is the customer's, social and green expectations. The idea is, of course, to find the best trade-off between maximizing their sustainable value of the product and minimizing the cost for the companies. The fourth goal category is using models to consider different possible futures or scenarios. And typically, many possible futures are considered by varying the assumptions. Development of scenarios typically involves a lot of stakeholder involvement. And fortunately for you, especially since I'm not an expert on these, scenario modeling is discussed in much more detail in other tutorials in this series, including one by Vanessa Schweizer and Hannah Casso. There's also a closely related one in this series on futures modeling by Jamie Ashander. Scenario models can take many forms, simulation models, system dynamic models, Asian-based models, but generally they involve exploring a large range of potential parameters and behavioral assumptions to reflect the diversity of scenarios and stakeholder input. Let me give you an example. Former succinct postdoc Ginger Allington and colleagues use stakeholder input to develop a systems dynamic model to explore potential futures of arid grasslands and livestock that influence people living on the Mongolian Plateau. She looked at outcomes depending on what decisions individuals and governments make and was able to show that environmental policies played a key role in the future trajectories of Inner Mongolia, while economic development was driving trajectories in adjacent Mongolia. In addition to modeling approaches that work best for the four categories of goals I've described, I should mention it's common to see hybrids of different modeling traditions applied to socio-environmental problems, for example, bioeconomic models combine economic and ecological modeling traditions and have been used extensively for things like sustainable fishery management. They're also useful for understanding the human welfare effects of changes in environmental quality. Hybrid approaches are also often used in what are called integrated assessment models. These are used to understand how different societal decisions influence Earth systems and vice versa. They typically bring biophysical and societal or economic models together to inform decision making, or in theory, to inform decision making. Often they're used to tackle questions related to climate change and policies that are associated with things like energy or land use change. And we have a whole tutorial in this series led by Dion Bacchus that's devoted to the use and development of integrated assessment models. But remember, model formalization, that is selecting the modeling approach, is part of a larger process that begins with an interdisciplinary team, often involving stakeholders, and they work together on a focused problem. Okay, time to wind things down. So what have we covered in this whole three-part tutorial? Well, we started off describing socio-environmental systems as nonlinear dynamical systems with characteristics common to other types of complex adaptive systems. These characteristics influence how they are modeled and the challenges that come. Their behavior or state emerges from the many nonlinear interactions and is difficult to predict. We then talked about why problems associated with socio-environmental systems are called wicked problems that are hard to define in part because people can perceive them so differently. But we also described how modelers can cope with this and other challenges. Then just now in this third part, we talked about the selection of a modeling approach, i.e. moving from concept to formalization. I'd encourage you to check out our other tutorials and webcasts, many of which will be added over the next several months. It's true that the use of modeling to address socio-environmental systems requires dealing with many challenges, like those outlined in Sandes El Sawa's grand challenges in environmental modeling. But it's important to know that socio-environmental modeling is becoming one of the most often used tools to solve problems that matter for people in the environment.
In closing, I want to thank the core group who helped develop and conceptualize all the tutorials and contributed significantly in this effort along with Succinct, particularly our videographers. They're from multiple countries with multiple backgrounds and experiences, but all are very enthusiastic about socio-environmental systems. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed it.